Hello, church family, and good evening. It's Dave and Debbie with Digging Deeper, <laughs> and we talked Pastor Mark into joining us tonight. Um, he gave his first sermon at Living Hope last Sunday. It was awesome. I really enjoyed Thank you, it. Thank you for that. So we thought we would just kind of take this time to get to know him a little bit better. So we have prepared some questions um, to ask him. So you want to go ahead and start? Okay. Well, I tried to think of questions that people in our congregation might have about Mark. Uh, and uh, so I got some questions here. And tell me what you think later. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Mark, how would you describe your style of ministry? I know you've been in ministry a number of years, and you've probably developed a, a, a particular style. And How would you describe that? Yeah, the short version of it, Dave, is um, I really think about ministry for myself as uh, working with the Holy Spirit in his project of trying to develop people. Mm -hmm. um, and so if a person doesn't know the Lord yet, the development that they need is to come into faith. Um, if they're a new believer, that development is discipleship. If they're an established believer, then they need help uh, growing in their ministry and their ability to, to impact others. But I'm thinking about working with the Holy Spirit to cooperate with what the Holy Spirit's doing in another person's life. Um, particularly for me, what that means is uh, I spend more of my time uh, developing leaders than almost anything else. I just gravitate to that. You know, some people... Um, they gravitate to, to being out in the street and just finding strangers and sharing Jesus with them. I, I do that, but it's not, not what I gravitate toward. Mm. Uh, other people love the administration and they love to go in lots of church meetings. Um, I can handle as many, many church <laughs> meetings as the next person, but I'm just aching to get the leader of that meeting aside and say, let's go ahead and debrief that. So yeah. uh, I'm, I'm an equipper or uh, a leadership trainer, uh, and that explains why I've spent a lot of my time in Bible colleges. Uh, where I could really zero in on just helping future leaders of the church find uh, the way that God speaks to them. You mentioned the Bible College. Uh, you you did teach at uh, New Hope uh, Christian College. Is that the name of it? That's right. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I, I didn't know if they had a name change or not. <laughs> um, uh, you taught classes there, and I'm I'm curious what classes you did teach, and what your your uh, favorite classes were. And also, I, I want to know what, I know you had a title of some sort there, and so oh, what well, was that title? Yeah, the title, most of the time I was there, I was academic dean. Academic dean, okay. And so I was responsible for uh, hiring and uh, uh, equipping teachers to do their best possible job. Okay. Um, and negotiating the connection between teachers and, and uh, faculty, the faculty and the students, which sometimes is a little awkward. Uh, but it, I enjoyed it. Um, Every semester I taught at least a couple of courses, and most of those were Bible-related courses. Um, and so my favorite one, I think, um, I love teaching Luke and Acts because um, it gives what I think is a really 21st century view of what the church is about. Yeah. Um, uh, Luke describes how Jesus cares for people that no one else mm -hmm. cared for. No matter their race, no matter their gender, no matter their income, Jesus is out there taking care of people that everyone else forgot. And that just, that just grabs me. Uh, we had one semester that was very tough on the students, and so it, it seemed like about once a month we'd, I'd just kind of throw out the lesson plan and say, we need to talk about what's going on in your life. And rather than talking about Jesus, let's allow Jesus to come into your lives right now. And I think most of you will remember, um, it's like three or four years ago now when they had the mass shooting in Las Vegas. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I went to class knowing that probably somebody in that class had knew someone that was at that shooting. What I didn't know oh. was the guy who sat right on the front row um, shared with me before class that he wasn't for sure if he could stay for all that class because he had a good friend that was actually shot and killed. Uh -oh. mm. Wow. So all my great things about how to study a parable kind of went out the door. Mm. And we just sat and talked about, you know, why do people do horrible things? You know, and what can we as believers and what can the church as a group, what can we do when tragedy hits? Mm. Uh, because people have just been overrun by the evil tendency in their life. It was a very rewarding time, but very hard. Yeah. And, and I continue to pray for that young man and for other young men and women that were impacted by that uh, just wow. horrendous event. Yeah. 
So that makes me wonder, because you're talking about teaching up there, and the conversations you and I have had, and I know that you really enjoy small groups, so are you going to reveal any ideas you have <laughs> maybe for some small groups here at Living Hope? Um, I have lots of ideas, and I'm going to be spending the next month talking to you all and seeing what kind of engages, what excites you the most. Certainly, um, the easiest thing to do is just to pull out a book of the Bible like John or, or Ephesians and just go through it verse by verse. Uh, but I think probably to get started with my, my th thought of I want to do things in such a way that I can pass it off then to somebody else to continue. Um, there's some really good um, video supported Bible studies that are out there available. Uh, one is called Public Jesus that allows um, especially younger people with the questions that they have uh, to look at the, the questions that people have about what it means to be a Christian mm -hmm. and talk about how we follow Jesus uh, in a very different world than what you and I grew up in. Uh, uh -huh. And I've taught that um, one time, and I was just blown away with how um, the folks in their 20s and 30s were really encouraged that they could finally talk about the things that mean something to them. Uh -huh. um, there's another great one that um, talks about uh, the main aspects of God, but the way that he does it is a travel log. Uh, uh -huh. There's six different short videos, about 15 minutes each, and each one is from a different country. Like one is from oh. Sweden. So when he's, when he's, fun. That's like yeah. fun. Wouldn't that be cool? Yeah. And so you go yeah. and you watch this and you learn something about Sweden and, and the very funny foods that they eat. And you feel I mean, like you've been on Excuse me, all my, all my Swedish <laughs> friends. Um, but, but you find out the strange foods that they eat and some of the customs. And then you talk to people who, he talks to people who don't know Jesus and those who, who do. Mm. And from that, he kind of gets a, a picture of how is what God is doing in this country how does it reveal to us one of the core aspects of what God is about today? Wow. So there, there's two or three things like that that we can do. And certainly, um, Debbie, you showed me one thing on spiritual gifts. Mm -hmm. And I think people learning how it is that God uses them and then doing that, not just learning about it, but actually doing it, some kind of Bible study that would help with that would be yeah. uh, something very special to me. Yeah, that sounds good. And then also, I think today on the phone we talked a little bit, and you had some ideas about... I think you called it the 40 and under group, and you had some ideas that you shared with me about doing some things with that group because um, you said the, their culture and what's, I can't remember how you put it, and I wish I could remember well, yeah, what you yeah. said. I, so I don't what, remember exactly what, what I said either. <laughs> <laughs> My memory's good but horribly short. What was appropriate <laughs> when we were that age is different in the church yeah. than what's appropriate now. Yeah. What, how did you well, say that? So thought, we'll be talking quite a bit um, in the fall um, about the reality of, um, in today's world, we don't just have one culture in, in Eugene. We've got eight or nine major cultures. And one of the big differences is there is a huge cultural shift between the folks who are 40, 45 and older and those who are 40, 45 and younger. And they've gone through a whole lot of trauma that we would never have imagined. And out of that, they've developed a whole different way of looking at the world. Mm -hmm. um, and Christ wants to interact with that world, and there are some great stories and some great friends that I have that have really become just, um, just wonderful, powerful witnesses for Jesus uh, who are in their 20s and 30s. But um, it's going to take for us older folks, I think, a, a time to say, you know, how do we make that shift so we can be um, at least a bicultural church, mm -hmm. one that still honors folks that grew up um, on the Gaithers, <laughs> and, and 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 one that's My all fingers. about <laughs> one that's all about the Crowder band. Yeah, okay. yeah. You know, and, yeah. and I don't completely understand it, but I love it. And the people in that, I, I have a love. And so, uh, we'll be talking uh, with folks in that age and say, how can we create uh, a church that's kind of evolving to be more attractive mm -hmm. to folks who are just starting to raise their families. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a good idea. Well, Mark, you're the son of a pastor, but. What I was wondering, what motivated you to become a pastor? Uh, I'll tell you the full story later on, Dave, sometime in the okay. sermon, because uh, my father being a pastor motivated, motivated me to be anything but. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, my, my little bit of rebellion, and there wasn't much, but my little bit of rebellion in high school and college years was, you know, I was just really dedicated. I was going to prove that... Um, that I didn't have to be like my dad. And uh, since I was 22, I've been consistently exactly like my dad um, in all the 
well, a lot of the big picture. Um, but what motivated me to become a pastor was uh, as I was going, um, after I had that experience I talked about on Sunday where I was just filled with the Holy Spirit, and I found that God wanted to use me, and God was using me in ministry, then I started saying, well, how, where is it that that ministry is most evident? And I had uh, my family and my friends and various uh, Bible teachers in my life saying, um, Mark, the thing that God does most consistently with you is he uses, the, he uses you to make the Bible come alive to other people. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. that, that's what I love to do. And we've been in a small group, and so you yeah. know, a little bit of idea yeah. what I mean by that. Yeah. I love the miracle that happens. I don't know how it happens, but I sit down with eight other people in a Bible passage, and all of a sudden Jesus shows up. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I remember. We were in a small group together. We were. With yeah. your wife, and oh gosh, the living room was full. I don't a know. A lot of other great, couples. wonderful Christians. That was about yeah. eight years yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. And we yeah. actually would watch a, a pastor on TV. Yeah. Wasn't that just, it for about half an hour? And then we would discuss his sermon. Yeah. That was really fun. Yeah. yeah, I enjoyed that. We did have some history uh, together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Most of it good history. Most yeah. of it good. Uh, <laughs> another question that I thought might be a good one to ask you is, what scripture has a special, what scripture, if any, has a very special meaning for you and speaks to you and yeah. maybe in a certain way that others don't maybe not see it that way? I think for me, some people have had a life verse that's always been the controlling verse. Uh, for me, in the different stages of my life, there's been uh, different verses that were really meaningful to me. Uh, but Dave, right now, uh, the verse that immediately pops to mind when you ask that is um, Philippians 1.6. For I'm confident in this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will continue to perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so uh, what I like about that verse is, number one, it's reassuring to say, God began something, but he didn't give up on you. Mm. And God's going to continue that. Uh, and so kind of the challenge it gives to me is to say, uh, what new thing does God want to develop and mark today? Mm. Okay. And so I wake up in the morning with that um, on at least a monthly basis. I sit down for an extended period of time and I say, you know, God, what is there in my life that you want to develop? Are there some things you want to kick out of my life? Mm -hmm. um, but God is continually in the process of perfecting me um, until the day of Christ Jesus, until the day we see him face to face. That's a great verse. I was yeah. just thinking that would be a good verse to put on my refrigerator, especially when I start a new diet. <laughs> <laughs> it sure would be. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the last question I have for you, Mark, is what was one of the most challenging things that you've had to face in your life or ministry? I don't know. If maybe life is a little separate than your ministry. Yeah, I think, I think actually um, both of them are it's the same answer. Okay. Um, and that is uh, working with marriages that are troubled mm. has been a, a, a big challenge and it always just humbles me and overwhelms me when a couple comes to me and they say um, Mark we've been married for three months or three years or 30 years and we don't think we want to be married anymore I don't mm. love her she doesn't love me um, sometimes one person will come and they'll talk about sometimes they will both come in um, had a couple of people come in as a couple and ask if I would bless them getting a divorce. Oh. And I said, I'm going to bless you, but I don't think you need a divorce. <laughs> um, you know, and some of those times when I've worked with people, God's been gracious. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've seen marriages healed. Um, my funnest story is um, when I was teaching out in Kansas with a woman that came to me. and She gave me all the reasons. And she'd been, she'd been setting me up for this for like for a month. And one day she came to me with all the reasons she had to divorce her husband because it was God's will. Um, and I thought, you know, I don't know if that's ever God's will. Maybe sometimes, there are sometimes, and the Bible says, for the hardness of heart. Um, so I said, you know, let's keep talking about this. Well, both of them had a divorce. They were very much agreed that they had to get a divorce. And almost one year later, I just stood in the church and I uh, officiated their new marriage. Oh, wow. They they re renewed their vows, or they uh, divorced and got remarried? They got, they got divorced. They were they were divorced. They lived apart for a year. But the student came back to me after about six or seven months and said, you know, um, that husband of mine is still a heel, and, uh, and he doesn't love Jesus like I do, and he doesn't understand me. Um, 
but I know he's the husband that God gave to me. Yeah. I made a lifelong commitment, and uh, I stepped out of that. Mark was that wrong? I said, God can heal anything. Mm -hmm. And so um, I talked to the man a little bit, and um, they came in, and it, it was just a fun experience, because I, I was pretty, pretty blunt with them, but during the wedding ceremony, I said, you know, 20 years ago you had the ceremony, and you didn't even know who the other person was. You just thought you were all goo goo eyes for them. <laughs> yeah. Now she I knows said, what she's getting into. I said, yeah. now you know what the other person's like with all their warts. And yeah. so when you say I do, you're not saying I do for the good part. Yeah. You're saying I do for the whole part. And they said, absolutely, Mark. Let's yeah. get on with it. Um, it was a beautiful ceremony. There were like five of us in the room. Oh. <laughs> that was not because of COVID, but it was a remarriage, mm -hmm. you know, and. They just wanted it to be something very special and sacred to them, and mm -hmm. they had their kids come. Oh, wow. So, so this, this I, I have a question here, and this might kind of put you on the spot, but you said something there that I've often wondered how to answer, because I have been told this too many times, is when somebody comes to you and, say, and says, I no longer love my husband, I no longer love my wife. How do you respond to that? Is there is there a I, I don't I don't know if there's right. one answer, but what are, what are no, some I of the things that? No, I respond to it the same way that you would respond to it. I say, tell me more. Uh huh. Um, because there's always a story, and um, if I get the person telling the story, then at that point they're becoming open to the story of saying, you know, what what did God do with marriage originally? Mm -hmm. What God did with originally was. God decided there had to be someone totally opposite from Adam. And he knew there was only someone totally opposite from him, totally different, that would be a good spouse. And so he brought them together. And when God brought them together, he said, you're two erratically different. But when I bring you together, you're going to be one unit that's far greater than the two that you were individually. And I'm saying, you know, do you really want to break up something that God created that God said is greater? Can we think about this? Can we pray about it? Can we look at ways in which maybe God's still at work in your marriage? Mm -hmm. But it is a very tough and challenging thing. And I don't always get it right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and some people come to me and they've already made their decision and they're not going to listen. But mm -hmm. uh, there are people who will come and who think it's dead. Mm -hmm. You know, but um, who is Jesus? Jesus is the guy who was dead. And he's alive now. That's right. And I've seen marriages that were dead that are alive now. I've seen young guys who were dead in their trespasses and sin, mm -hmm. and they're alive now. And I've seen churches that thought that they were dead. Not this one, but <laughs> this one's was living hope, right? <laughs> but I, I, I've gone to churches that were sure that they were dead. Right. And I've gone to churches that, where the church told me, we're a dead church. Why would you want to come here? And I said, well, because God loves taking dead things and making them live again. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. So that's my living hope. Yeah, that's great. I'm looking forward to the ministry that you're going to have here and that we're going to share with you as a congregation. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But as, as, far as far as the small groups go, we're going to kind of have to wait and see what COVID's doing and stuff, or should we be really pushing you to get these going? Well, um, no, we will get small groups started one way or the other in the fall. Um, I'm experiencing this week how tough it is to get a group of people together in July or August. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have a lot of other things that we need to get done in the few warm months that we have. Uh, but once we get in the fall and things are settled into a routine, um, it will be social distancing, as far as I can tell, mm -hmm. at least until March, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but we will find ways, and I've already started talking to the leadership of the church and to those on the equippers to say, we need to start thinking how we're going to redo ministry so we can expand what we do even though we can't get together. And so I've already identified ways that we can do small groups mm -hmm. and have some great small groups, mm -hmm. even though we can't be in the same room. And yeah. it starts with that yeah. horrible word that begins with a Z, mm -hmm. uh, the Zoom. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. And, and, so, and we have been doing Zoom, our journaling group. Oh, okay. have, we have we continued yeah. our Zoom yeah. on Thursday nights, and then usually we break for a little bit in the summer, but we were so enjoying the Zoom <laughs> because, you know, you could just in the relaxing of your living room you can get together and fellowship with all these people so we're still meeting on Thursday nights for a brief time and we're just sharing a personal 
aha moment or devotion time that we've had with God during the week. So if you want to join that, you need to call um, probably Stacy or Bonnie and get onto that. And it's just four to six of us that meet on Thursday night and share what God's doing through Zoom. So if you have any experience Zoom and you want to, it would really be a good way to introduce you to it. Great. So I'm glad you have so much planned or are trying to get a lot planned. So God we're, bless we're you. We're working on it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I don't have any more questions. Well, I think the people watching probably do. So what I would suggest is that you type them to Mark. Um, email them or type them or text yep. them or something. Absolutely. He is here in the office now. If you want to come in and say hi, he will be happy to get to know you face-to-face. -face. And um, so thank you, Mark, for this time. So my email, uh, Pastor Mark, one word, Pastor Mark at onelivinghope.net. And that's one spelled out, O-N-E, yes. onelivinghope.net. Great. So, thank you. Thank you. God Bye. bless you, church family.